so to discuss uh, the result of the last hour, I did a few mistakes. Here this plus sign was extra. There is no plus sign here. It's just multiplied here. I also multiplied here, but this is just the amplitude. What, uh, how does it change then the discussion? It changes, there is no plus sign here, uh, not here. This is just a product and not here. So I have to correct this. This was the mistake I made last hour. I, I just rewrote here in the wrong fashion. So uh, now what cancels out? Uh, the point we got here, what cancels out? Uh, so now, this cancels out with this one here. Okay? Uh, next, I forgot this one half here. This one half here because I already used the two of the two cosines for the lambda. So it's one half here. One half here. And one half puts a two in here. This two cancels out with this two. What is now left over, just to explain what is going on with, uh, I have here the integral. And what is let left over this, uh, this expression up here. This is just free space loss between the receiver and transmitter with no obstacle at all. I could also call this E infinity. So our E is actually uh, uh, absolute value of, uh, can, can take it correctly, also including the phase, is now E infinity with no obstacle times the solution of our integral. Just to simplify all this, uh, this uh, long thing here. And this integral is the thing that is oscillating from 1 to 2. So uh, rethinking this uh, same expression, I could say, that here I have the electric field, absolute value, just, I'm just drawing the absolute value, and here I have E infinity, and here I have twice E infinity. Just absolute value because here I'm not plotting the phase. What does happen in reality? Uh, so uh, in reality, uh, what, uh, first to uh, show these two examples, I draw here the shade of a circular obstacle or uh, the diffracted field after the aperture. I have to also write this, this example here, but I have to rewrite it when I, where I have the space. I have to remove anything else from our board. I have to draw this once again, just to show it. It's nothing wrong, but I just have to draw it once again to explain you what is happening. So if I have an, uh, a circular aperture in my screen, so this is the aperture and shade all around, I'm just writing the x and y axis. I'm not drawing the z axis just to keep things simple. Uh, again, if I have here the, the transmitter, at the point of the receiver, at the plane of the receiver, what do I get? I get uh, now the shade. And of course, uh, I should get now, according to geomet geometrical theory, uh, I should only get here uh, a perfectly illuminated area. and uh, nothing outside of it, because I have shade here. And of course, this does not explain this oscillation here. It explains just one here. What really happens in the real world, uh, um, oh, here it is. In the real world, I have some diffraction over here. Okay, and that's, uh, that could be understood. But the really strange thing come, comes in the center. I have some diffraction here, but here I get new oscillation close to the axis, 
And here I may have double field or I may have zero. Depending on slight changes here on the radius or slight changes of the, of the distance. So I may get both, both E is equal to zero or here E is equal to twice uh, E infinity. Here. Uh, and this is the if diffraction effect. This is uh, the diffraction effect after a circular aperture. Uh, why we don't see these effects in, in real life? This effect, diffraction, also the Arago spot, always happens. But we have to specially arrange our experiments to be able to see these things. Uh, the problem is really not in our eyes, but in the processing in our head. Our head is already designed to remove all diffraction effects from the image we see through our eyes. And there are algorithms that use this processing in our head. Which is the most uh, common and known algorithm that is using this processing in our head? That removes the fraction out of a picture we see with our eyes. If you uh, uh, learn something about the image processing, you should know it. You have a, a, sub, a course on image processing here. On image processing and video processing. I know that you have that on the curriculum. What is the most important effect you, you see in practice here? The most important effect is JPEG compression. JPEG compression uses exactly this. JPEG compression causes distortion to pictures. But the distortion caused by JPEG compression is exactly identical to the diffraction effects. And our brain is trained to remove diffraction effects from the picture we see. And that's the reason why JPEG is so efficient, because the picture is distorted after we, we use JPEG compression. But our brain doesn't see that. In fact, we do have some pictures that get really awful uh, when you are using, uh, especially if you have computer-made drawings. Uh, they all look uh, with all these artifacts of JPEG compression. And if you, you, if you are using a stupid word processor like Word for Windows, Word for Windows converts all images or graphics into JPEG and causes all these distortions you can then see in the result produced by Word for Windows. But uh, computer guys know nothing about uh, diffraction and uh, that's the reason why they don't understand this thing. We, un we, we hopefully understand it because we draw down the integrals here. So um, diffraction is actually something that always happens in real life and we have very important computer algorithms like JPEG compression that are using, uh, uh, using, uh, and using the ability of our brain to remove uh, artifacts like those caused by uh, diffraction. Now, why don't we see this in practice? Because we actually simplified this by removing the amplitude variation. Uh, the amplitude variation, what does it cause in real life? In real life, as we increase rho here, both the, uh, the, numerator, the numerator increases and the cosines do decrease. So in the real world, these graphs uh, this graph here looks like this. At the beginning, the real, the real result, including all terms, is similar. But afterwards, the amplitude starts decreasing. Like with all diffraction algorithms. So the amplitude actually starts decreasing. And uh, finally, it stabilizes around the infinity. Uh, this decrease of the amplitude is very small, especially very small in real world uh, radio link applications like here. So this, this decays really slowly. It's oscillating for a long time before decaying uh, uh, to its stable infinity value. So uh, with the previous lecture, we saw some new effects making our life complicated. But on the other hand, 
we didn't answer our main question. How much space does the propagation of radio waves require or light waves or whatever kind of waves you want? Uh, this is also valid for song, sound waves. The, we could do the same uh, derivation for sound waves, which are longitudinal waves. It's no, in no way uh, linked to transversal waves. It's no way linked to polarization of the waves. This holds for all. Uh, so, what is now the important uh, uh, reasoning behind uh, this thing? Now, let's see how do we come to this result here. This field doubling or field vanishing on the axis of our obstacle. We should know now that here we have actually two effects. We have a direct ray. Here. And the direct ray is where? The direct ray is here. And we have a refracted wave here. A refracted wave that's refra uh, the diffracted wave. Uh, the, uh, diffracted wave that, uh, that's diffracted off the edge of our circular aperture. We have a diffracted ray here. And the interference of these two rays gives us an interference pattern. And that's what we got here. If we calculate things, if we calculate actually the value of this uh, uh, equation here, how large it is. And this is actually the path difference. The path difference, so this is actually the path difference, multiplied by the wave number. And when this thing is equal to pi, we get phase reversal. So we can go now the other way around. Where do we get now the, uh, the phase reversal? So when uh, the length of the direct wave is uh, the, uh, ref uh, um, the refracted wave is exactly half a wavelength here. Because if this is half a wavelength, so if this is uh, lambda half, lambda half, multiplied by k, k is uh, 2 pi over lambda. This is actually equal to pi. This is k. This was k. We get the pi phase difference. Where do we get this pi phase difference? We could also calculate this thing in another fashion, uh, just using this plot here, uh, using the simplifications we had. Uh, where is this thing equal to pi? Uh, so, uh, <coughs> these are the additions, these are the additions. When this thing, say, we have it here, down here. Uh, but just in, in place of A, we write just a row here, a row squared. When, where do we have phase reversal? We get phase reversal when this thing, say, uh, rho squared times, uh, now we have, uh, to rewrite it, 2 uh, d dx, d uh, rx, uh, d dx plus d rx, when this thing is equal to how much? To lambda half. Then we have phase reversal. And this first phase reversal is here. First phase reversal. When we actually meet the correct radius, we're going to call this radi radius rho 1. So when we have rho 1, we have lambda half. Uh, or rho n for n times phase reversals, uh, times dtx plus drx over 2 dtx drx is equal to n times uh, lambda half. 
so row n here we would have row 2 uh, row 3 uh, uh, row 4 and so on so now to calculate these things we have to just to flip everything uh, what we could do further here we could cancel this two out of the equation we could get rid of it because it's it's, it's on both sides of the equation we can cancel it out uh, and we can calculate now rho n where these things happen this phase reversal happens is now square root of what of lambda uh, n times lambda times uh, dtx drx uh, dtx plus drx I have to flip this fraction around because I'm transferring on the other side of the equation and these are now a number of radii uh, of radii that uh, actually define where do the, fr uh, the flips happen and these are actually the radii of Fresnel zones uh, how do we define these Fresnel zones uh, I further need some picture here to show it out uh, can I erase this thing here so this could be erased just to get place on the board transmitter I have a receiver I have the plane of my obstacle uh, X and Y and then I have the Fresnel zone so row 1 is a circle with the radi radius of row 1 so this is row 1, row one. and this is the first uh, Fresnel zone so Fresnel zone the second Fresnel zone will be at row 2 uh, but not the whole just the just the ring around so the second Fresnel zone with, between row 1 and row 2 this is called the second uh, Fresnel zone and the third Fresnel zone is actually what we get out here So this is uh, row 3 here, row 3, and between row 2 and row 3, I have a ring that makes the third Fresnel zone. So Fresnel zones are actually, except for the first one, for the first one is a circle, uh, the higher ones are just rings, just placed between two adjacent uh, uh, zones. So from 0 to row 1 is the first Fresnel zone, from the run to row 2 is second and third. And these Fresnel zones will tell us a lot about, about the propagation of our radio waves. Though we don't know exactly how these things rings out. We'll see next hour how, how it's, we get, get a much more meaningful, meaningful result. Now this is looking at the problem uh, in the two dimensions, just in the xy plane. But if we try to draw the same in three dimensions, in three dimensions, actually these Fresnel zones, if I move the xy plane, sum up into an ellipsoid. And this is now the first Fresnel ellipsoid 
it takes us it tells us much about the propagation of radio waves uh, you see that the Fresnel ellipsoid uh, includes both the receiver and the transmitter. What is the distance here between the transmitter and the end of the ellipsoid? We have to flip the phase by pi, by lambda half. So if uh, the radiation goes from the transmitter to the ellipsoid and all the way back to the receiver, we should be exactly here a quarter wavelength behind. So this is exactly a quarter wavelength. And then the next ellipsoid, the second Fresnel ellips ellipsoid, is now if we uh, sum all the Fresnel zones moving the xy plane here. And get here with the second Fresnel ellipsoid. And we could do the same with the third one. So uh, these uh, things actually make uh, 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 divide the space of our radio link into some meaningful, uh, meaningful uh, surfaces, some meaningful volumes that tell us a lot about the phase and phase changes over here. And if we have a circular aperture in our screen, then this thing is oscillating exactly according to the radii of the Fresnel zones. <coughs> so what does that mean? If uh, this is the given distance from transmitter to receiver, then any line getting up to the Fresnel ellipsoid if these are the two focal points, the two foci of the, uh, of the ellipsoid, uh, this distance here is exactly to the first ellipsoid, is actually uh, exactly the direct distance, so the uh, dx plus drx plus lambda half. Lambda half is the line contacting the ellipsoid, and you know that you can draw the ellipse or an ellipsoid in three dimensions in this way, putting taking a piece of rope that is slightly longer than the distance between the two focal points of the ellipse. And now that, that increment in the distance is exactly lambda half for the first ellipsoid, it's lambda for the second, so the second ellipsoid should have this uh, uh, d, dx plus drx plus twice lambda half. And for the third is three times. So in this way, we divided the space in some useful regions. Uh, what about our integral here? How does this integral work? The integral we had drawn before. The integral we have to draw before, we could uh, uh, draw this same solution into the uh, uh, complex plane, real axis, imaginary axis. So uh, we said that we start at zero and our integral now follows a circle. So the green circle should be here, so the green circle should be here and it follows the same path all the way around. And it always repeats if we neglect the decay of the amplitude. And here we get a radius of 2, E0, E infinity, and E infinity is at the center. Infinity. What happens in the real world? We, in the real world we have a small decay of the field, say we have a spiral slowly approaching the center of this circle. And you see that this spiral, you know, after many, many, many turns, it gets up in, in the center. So our actual electric field, our electric field is a, a phaser starting from the origin and ending on the circle. So this is E simplified or simplified and the real E 
the real E is uh, up to the spiral. This is the real E we get. This is the whole picture and this, uh, this decay, this spiraling uh, to E infinity is very, very slow. In the real world, as we have it here on the desk, in the real, in, 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 in scale, the scale experiment, this, this thing is very, very small, very, very slow. Well, we can see now what can we do with such devices, what can we build with such devices. One idea is, uh, can we actually use this device to focus radiation? Say, what happens if uh, I shade some of the Fresnel zones? So if I have, I redraw here the Fresnel zones, uh, I leave open the first Fresnel zones, I shade the second. I leave free the third Fresnel zone, shade the fourth Fresnel zone, I shade the fourth, and I uh, leave everything free here, so this is X. This is why. So what I get in the sum, in the phasor sum, this is real axis, if this is imaginary axis. I get the open first Fresnel zone. So first, first Fresnel zone is just half of the circle here. So this is first Fresnel zone. The second Fresnel zone is shaded, so I get nothing. But the third Fresnel zone goes again along the circle. The third Fresnel zone goes again along the circle. So I get here the third Fresnel zone. And uh, finally, I have the fifth and all the uh, upper Fresnel zones. So I have the spiral at the end. This is fifth uh, up to infinity. What electric field do I get here at the receiving side? If here was the transmitter, here was the receiver. What uh, field do I have? The received field is now this phaser here. And this phaser is twice infinity plus twice E infinity plus one infinity. So the E I am actually getting here is about five times E infinity. So I can make a focusing device out of shading here even Fresnel zones. Or in other words, I could also shade uh, uh, odd Fresnel zones. But just taking uh, shading every second Fresnel zone taking out, I can make a converging lens. Just making shade, shades. Uh, what is the difference between a Fresnel lens and the dielectric lens? Well, the dielectric lens is using all of the phasers here. Uh, I'm not shading any of them, and it's correcting the phase to all of the phasers. So the uh, dielectric lens would have a much larger electric field. So if I put here uh, the electric lens, for the electric lens, I would obtain a much larger E for the dielectric lens. Uh, why this E would be much larger? Because I correct the phase of any single contribution. So the dielectric lens, in place of the uh, Fresnel zones here, I put here the electric lens. And this lens is actually straightening up all the contribution plus at the end, where I have no longer any material, here I have the dielectric, uh, I simply have the, uh, the spiral at the end. What is the ratio between the e-dielectric lens and f Fresnel lens? Uh, the e-dielectric lens, I have all this strengthened out. So with the a Fresnel lens, I obtain two twice is, is infinity. And for the 
uh, the electric lens for the same first and second phase, and so I obtain two pi infinity. So uh, electric field of the dielectric lens is approximately pi times electric field of the Fresnel lens. Pi times because uh, here I obtain two twice for the uh, first Fresnel, so zero for the second, twice for the uh, third, zero for the fourth, uh, twice for the fifth, zero for the sixth, if I had more. Uh, so I have, I have uh, two here for the Fresnel lens over uh, for, the, for the same uh, uh, geometry for the dielectric lens I have obtained 2 pi. 2 pi is the circumference of this. So it's 2 pi here is really 2 pi over 2 that equals 2 pi. So the e dielectric lens is uh, approximately as I said uh, pi times e Fresnel lens or in decibels, so logarithm uh, e dielectric lens is approximately 10 dB plus logarithm of Fresnel lens. So we see what is the advantage of making dielectric lenses. They are much better. We get 10 dB more signal than with Fresnel lenses because pi uh, logarithm of, 10, uh, of pi to the base of 10 is about one is about uh, one half and one half multiplied by 20 is 10 dB by 20 dB because with the fields we are using uh, fields expressed in uh, uh, decibel they are 20 times uh, logarithm to the base of 10 so here is 20 in front of the logarithm 20 in front uh, because we are fields and uh, 20 times logarithm of pi is 10 dB, approximately 10 dB. It's slightly less than 10 dB, really, because uh, pi squared is less than 10. It's slightly less than 10, but not, not much, really. But for uh, the accuracy of our calculations, this is all correct. We could also notice that if I make something like this device here, uh, and this uh, lens is not just opaque material, it's reflecting material. I also have a, a reflection focusing over here. I had a, a diffraction focusing here, diffraction. But I have reflection of this ring focusing here, Rx prime. So if I make just metal rings, I have a focal point here. But I have yet another focal here for the reflected waves. And also the reflected waves obey the same principle. So the reflected waves, if I draw them here, I have no, uh, no first zone, but on the reflected side, I have the second zone that's sh shaded or, and I have the fourth zone. So uh, this thing here would be actually the irreflected. The, the phasor of E reflected would be this way here. So uh, the Fresnel lens is actually not wasting any radiation if it's made of metal. It's focusing some of the radiation in the direction to the receiver because of diffraction. And it's also focusing some of the reflection to the transmitter. Uh, uh, in the direction of the transmitter, it's reflecting it back, and that also gets fo focused due to the sum of phases. So, uh, what could we do knowing the Fresnel principles now? How, how could we make a mirror, a parabolic mirror? We, we discussed about already about the parabolic mirror. And uh, What could we do with the mirror? If we have incident radiation over the mirror, okay, so we want to actually focus our incident radiation into a single point, like a parabolic dish does that. So if we have 
incoming radiation. We want to focus this radiation on a, into a single spot. So I'm just uh, drawing the cross sections now. So we could leave the first Fresnel zone open. First Fresnel zone, we could install a reflector. We could install a reflector on the third Fresnel zone. Uh, yeah. And I could install something on the fifth Fresnel zone. If I do this, uh, the reflected waves will actually focus in our correct focal point. They will sum in phase here. But I can do more with the reflector. With the reflector, I can put another surface on some ridges. Say I make here a ridge, a circular ridge, uh, on the second Fresnel zone. And I could put here another ridge on the fourth Fresnel zone. And if these ridges are how much high? If these ridges are high, are exactly lambda quarter high, then I also get focusing, I get a phase reversal because lambda quarter in one direction and lambda quarter back, I get the full reflection. So I uh, uh, phase reversal. Also, this one here focus here. So where is now the trick of the parabolic dish? With the real parabolic dish, I get focusing in all points. So the real parabolic dish would go this way. But uh, our, our approximation goes this way. So if I plot it on the... Uh, in the complex plane, uh, real imaginary, I adjust the face so that I'm real mainly with the sum here. Uh, I have one half circle for the first Fresnel zone. Then I have for the ridge over the second Fresnel zone, I have the second Fresnel zone here. Then I have again a valley for the third Fresnel zone. And I have again uh, a ridge on the fourth Fresnel zone. And finally, I have the fifth Fresnel zone. Uh, so here, what I get now uh, compared to E infinity, our electric field I get out of such a device. So this is the whole sum of all the phasors put together. This electric field now is approximately uh, 10 times, 10 times E infinity. So I obtained quite, uh, quite a lot. Or uh, compared to a parab parabolic dish, say a parabolic dish would give me how much? A parabolic dish would correct the phase in just every point. So I would not have here circles, uh, half circles, but I would have here a straight line. So a parabolic dish would give me a much stronger signal here. Electric field of parabolic dish. What is the ratio now? The ratio is straight line to semi half circle. And the ratio of the E that gives me the parabolic dish is uh, approximately now pi over 2 times electric field of the uh, Fresnel uh, reflector, how we call it. Fresnel reflector. Uh, or in logarithmic units, so uh, 20 times logarithm of E parabolic dish is now approximately, uh, here is 4 dB. 
uh, it's slightly less than 4 dB, plus 20 times the logarithm of the Fresnel reflector. So it, the parabolic dish is certainly more efficient than the uh, Fresnel reflector. Here the difference is not so big. We get, I get another 6 dB because I don't skip any Fresnel zones here. I don't skip anything here. So that's, uh, that's the advantage. Uh, but I lose 4 dB because uh, I have phase errors here and here and here. I have these half circles in place of a straight line of a true parabolic dish. Uh, so I get something also out of, I can get something also out of such uh, flat dish really. And this thing is not so, so stupid after all. A parabolic dish is very difficult to manufacture. We didn't uh, discuss this thing. Uh, it also, uh, the accuracy of the surface of the parabolic dish, in order to obtain this, has to be very accurate. Uh, while this dish can be made on a flat surface, this can be made flat like, like a styro styrofoam with some styrofoam rings glued to the uh, support and with aluminum foil uh, glued to the styrofoam. And that's the antenna. That's the dish and it's completely flat. And also people, people like flat antennas. They are prepared to pay more to have flat antennas just to avoid parabolic dishes because Parabolic dishes, you know, that, that, that drive some people crazy when they see the parabolic surface. So that's about uh, making directional antennas out of... Uh, what we could also do with the parabolic dish, we could do this. We could uh, make a Fresnel parabolic dish like this one, making up to here and then repeating the whole story. So we cut, uh, and this dish wouldn't lose any signal at all. So here we jump back down here and we go back down. So in this way, making a dish in this way, uh, shifting now by lambda half here. Here is lambda half and here is twice, uh, twice lambda half. Shifting by lambda half, I can make the parabolic dish flatter with such a circular, circular pattern. Um, maybe you heard about Fresnel lenses used uh, many years ago here at the university. We had projectors, overhead projectors, uh, working from transparencies, not from computers. And those had a very large Fresnel lens. The Fresnel lens was also had a surface like this. So we could make a, a flat lens uh, where we would need really a thick lens to do the same function. <coughs> so the... Uh, this is uh, actually our discussion of actually using, using these effects, using of this uh, phasor sum of fields to obtain more field by shading Fresnel zones or by me making reflectors in the form of Fresnel zones. Uh, okay, it's better now to make a break and we'll continue the discussion next hour. <coughs>